All right, we are very happy for our, our next talk to have Amanda Roy, who will be telling us in, about entanglement and CFTs with boundaries. Thank you. Thanks for the, I hope you can hear me. Um, and, and so uh, thank you for the introduction and it's a pleasure for me to be, to be here. Um, I had the pleasure of being in Mainz for a similar conference several years ago. It's a pity that uh, we cannot do this in person, but maybe not next time. So I will talk about entanglement in CFTs with boundaries. And when I sent the title, I had forgotten to write that I was going to talk about only one plus one dimensional systems. And this is because primarily the techniques that I will be using to, to calculate the entanglement properties analytically and numerically are mostly um, working well in one plus one D. Um, and another motivation we will come to at the very end of the talk. So I want to start with the basic idea of entanglement that has kind of been in, in the center stage of condensed matter physics for the last few decades. So imagine that you have a system which is split up into two parts, as you are seeing here, A and B, and you can think of a lattice model in, in any dimension if you want. And the question is, when, when is A entangled with B? And so the answer to this question is rather simple that A and B are entangled when the, when the state of A union B is not, not equal to the tensor product of the states of A and B. And this very fundamental feature of quantum mechanics was recognized very long time ago, dating back to works of Einstein and Schrodinger. And, and since then, for the much of the 20th century, it was treated like some kind of weird spooky thing that was used only to test funda fundamental foundational principles of quantum mechanics. And it was only in the 80s when people started to realize that entanglement was a resource like energy and it could be used to process information. And since then, entanglement has played a crucial role in our understanding of very many different topics and including quantum phase transitions and strongly correlated systems. And, and here I want to talk about a specific set of systems which, um, for which I want to calculate entanglement properties. And, but the definition like the one that I've provided here is not useful for getting any quantitative estimate. And, and so for this, we need measures of entanglement. One of the most natural candidates is the von Neumann entropy. And so this is defined here. And you can see that it's essentially a sum over the eigenvalues of the reduced density matrix with some specific weight. A second quantity is the, is the entanglement Hamiltonian where we do not sum over all the eigenvalues of the reduced density matrix, but instead look at all the eigenvalues of the reduced density matrix. And finally, these two quantities are important for understanding entanglement between A and B when A union B is in a pure state, but this doesn't always happen. And so when A union B is a mixed state, we need more, more sophisticated measures. And so one such measure is the log negativity. So in some sense, it measures the negativity of the eigenvalues of the density matrix. And it, it is calculated as follows. You take the density matrix of A union B, you take a partial transpose with respect. Then you take the absolute values of the, of the eigenvalues of, of this quantity, sum them over, then take the log. <laughs> That's how you define log negativity. And each of these quantities, um, they have their own merits. And what is really um, important is that these quantities contain signatures of, of very basic um, properties of the system. They contain signatures of quantum critical phenomena. They contain signatures of the underlying topological order or in non-equilibrium setting, they contain information about information scrambling. And my goal would be here to talk about this set of systems for which the von Neumann entropy in the entanglement Hamiltonian can be calculated quite well, the log negativity as well, but I will only focus on these two first two quantities. Okay, so now what can we say about the entanglement entropy in such a one plus one dimensional system. I will always take the system to be at zero temperature so that all the contribution to the von Neumann entropy will come from the, the entanglement. And we'll also look at only ground states. 
And so in terms of um, in terms of the behavior of entanglement entropy, there are some quite general statements that can be made. So for systems with gap spectrum, it turns out that the entanglement entropy of the part A goes with logarithm of the correlation length. And so you can think like this, that the that the entanglement entropy measures correlations around the entanglement cut. And so the length scale that is associated is the psi, and this is finite for the gap system. And why that is logarithmic, it's something that requires a bit more, bit more calculation. Now, if you have a gapless spectrum, on the other hand, then the correlation length is formally infinite. And so you simply hit the, the cutoff here, which is provided by the subsystem size. So in this case, the entanglement entropy goes as logarithm of the subsystem size. A very simple example of this would be the, the Ising chain. So this is a one-dimensional array of, of SU2 spins. The first term is the ferromagnetic interaction between nearest neighbors. And the second term is the transverse field. And lambda is the coupling constant. So you see that for lambda much, much smaller than one, you have the ferromagnetic interaction that is dominating. And so you have essentially two ground states, all right and all left. And this is the ferromagnetic phase. And for lambda much, much bigger than one, you have a paramagnetic phase. And in between these two phases, there is a phase transition point. This is an exactly solvable model. So we know the, the phase transition point exactly. It's at lambda equals one. And it is this point where the system is gapless. And at these points for these kind of gapless systems, due to conformal invariance, we can say a bit more about entanglement entropies. So for instance, in this logarithmic scaling with the subsystem size, one can show that the coefficient of the scaling is C over six, where C is the central charge. And so for the Ising model, which at criticality describes the, a free real fermion, the central charge is one half. But you can have a different model. This is the quantum rotor chain, where you have now sum over n i square, and there is a second term which is cos phi i minus phi i plus one. Phi i's are compact phase variables, and n's are canonically conjugate to these phi's. This is the commutation relation. And for these, for this model, for instance, you can have. Um, as you increase lambda, so for small lambda, you have a gapped phase, and then as you increase lambda around one, there is a costalist Taulis phase transition, after which the, the system transforms into a gapless phase, which is described by a C equals one free compact boson theory. And for these kind of systems, for these conformal invariant systems, one can say more about the, the dots here. So I, I had written here some C over six log L of A plus, plus these dots. And so we can actually say something more about even these dots. So if you now take a finite length system and which is the length is given by L, then you can show that the entanglement entropy depends on the boundary conditions. So imagine that you have imposed boundary conditions on both ends, and then you cut the system in the middle. So this entanglement cut then naturally gives rise to a boundary condition, which would be calling, which we will call beta. And then the entanglement entropy depends on these two boundary conditions. And you see the first term again is this logarithmic term. The argument of the logarithm now is a bit more complicated because it's a finite size system. However, the coefficient is still C over six. And, and then the subleading terms, there are now two terms arising from the two boundary conditions, alpha and beta. And these two terms are simply related to the G functions of these two boundaries. And you can see here that alpha is the boundary condition that is inherited from the parent theory, whereas beta is the boundary condition that comes from the entanglement cut. And for generic systems, um, this entanglement cut gives rise to free boundary conditions. And here S0 is, um, is a, is a non-universal lattice dependent term. And this way of calculating entanglement entropy makes it also very easy to, to extract quantities like the central charge 
or the, the boundary entropies. So traditionally, these quantities were computed by calculating the ground state energy and, and the, the free energy in the presence of impurities. Now, for that, you need to know a lot more information about the system, for instance, the velocity of excitations and so on. And here, just by calculating entanglement entropy, you can actually get the central charge and the boundary entropies in a very clean way. In fact, you get change in the boundary entropies and not, not actually the boundary entropy itself. And for these systems, you can go even further and calculate not just entanglement entropies, but entanglement Hamiltonians exactly. And so imagine again, this system, which is, um, this, which is a CFT with boundary condition alpha on both ends. And then you cut the system in the middle, then the entanglement Hamiltonian of this half of the system is given by this formula on the right-hand side. You see, it depends on some Hamiltonian H alpha beta, which is a boundary CFT Hamiltonian. It is this CFT that was describing this system. And now the boundary conditions are the boundary conditions coming from the parent system and the entanglement cut. And this then allows us to get the spectrum of the entanglement Hamiltonian also exactly because we can compute the partition functions of, of these CFTs um, on a cylinder very well. To give you a simple example of what I mean, let me show you the results for the Ising model. So if you look at the if you look at the Hamiltonian now, the first two terms are the bulk terms of the Ising model. You will notice that I have set the coefficient of each term to be one, so the model is critical. And then I have added an additional boundary perturbation pointing in the sigma x direction. So when lambda naught, this boundary perturbation is zero, then the model has open or free boundary conditions. And when lambda naught is small, but non-zero, then the model flows to the so-called Dirichlet fixed point. And now we can, we, can, we can compute the entanglement entropy for these two different boundary conditions. So here I'm showing you results of numerical computation using density matrix renormalization group. Yesterday in one of the talks, you were hearing about matrix product state representations of, of the many body systems. And here, this is the matrix product state computation in action where you use the DMRG um, algorithm to optimize the ground state and get the ground state of this model very well. And, and you see that I'm simulating a system of size about 1600 and I'm cutting the system at different parts in the space and computing the entanglement entropy for different bipartitioning. And this green curve is for Neumann boundary conditions where there is no boundary potential. And I had shown you earlier a formula for the entanglement entropy for finite systems. And when, when we use that formula and just try to get the central charge, we get a central charge that is very close to 0 0.5. And now the question is, what would happen if you add a small boundary potential? And so this is the maroon curve here where you see the entanglement entropy goes down. That it would go down is kind of obvious because you are fixing degrees of freedom at the boundary. And so the, the entropy should go down. And there is a more sophisticated thing. This is the, the, the G theorem, so to speak, where the entropy goes down by precisely the the difference in the in the log of the G functions, the Neumann boundary condition has G function one and Dirichlet has square root of two. So the change is log two over two. This, this quantity was first computed by Afflick and Ludwig in 91. And you can see here from our numerical data that the, the reduction of the entropy is very close to this number that is predicted analytically. Now for, for this Ising model, it's also very simple to calculate the entanglement spectrum because it's a minimal model. And, and so the boundary states um, had been computed very long time ago for this model. So this is so these boundary states were known from early works of Ishibashi and Cardi. And, and so we using this knowledge of the boundary states, so you will see that these are just the modular S matrices of the of the Ising model. And and then using this knowledge, we can directly compute the partition function. 
So for instance, for the Neumann boundary condition, you can write the partition function in terms of sums of the characters. These characters are all known explicitly. For instance, in this book of Di Francesco, they are all written in chapter eight. And from this, we can then compute the entanglement spectrum for the Ising model. And so this is the explicit expression for the Ising model entanglement spectrum with Neumann boundary conditions. And so you can see here that the, that the entanglement energies depend on two parameters, J and N. And, and, and so J here, in, can, J here depends on the, it, it's, it can be either zero or sigma or, or epsilon. For the Neumann case here, it can be only zero or epsilon. And N here is an integer. And for each of these, um, each of these energy levels, there is a degeneracy that can be also computed from this partition function calculation. And it is given here as PJ. So I will show you um, in a second some numerical data with the analytical predictions. And this is what is shown here. So this is again, numerical data for the, for, for the ground state of the Ising model. And here on, on the y-axis, I'm showing you the, the entanglement energies and on the x-axis are the two towers essentially of the, um, the two Virasoro towers for the two primary fields, zero and epsilon that show up in the Neumann boundary conditions. And you can see the, the dotted lines are the analytical predictions for the different level positions and the degeneracies are also shown here. And you can see for the low lying levels, the, the agreement is reasonably good. But as you go higher up in this picture, then you start seeing deviations from what is predicted. And this can be understood from the fact that we have finite simulation error. So remember that the, for a gapless system, the entanglement entropy grows logarithmically with system size. What that boils down to is that you need um, algebraically the, the number of states that is required to approximate the ground state in a numerical computation grows algebraically with system size. So while you can still get some amount of precision for the low lying levels, at, for high enough levels, you always will have discrepancies for these kind of tensor network computations. And uh, yes. Uh, sorry, just a quick question. So uh, is it correct that uh, this uh, degeneracy in the entanglement spectrum, the degeneracy is the same as the degeneracy in the open string Hamiltonian? This would the energy the levels are, are different, but uh, uh, the degeneracy are the same? The degeneracies are the same. Okay, and the yeah. energy levels are just shifted by this exponential pieces, I suppose. Yes, the, the energy levels are shifted by a certain amount. Yes, that's why I rescale them so that you can just see the pattern. Yes. Okay, thank you. And you can do the same computation um, for Dirichlet boundary conditions. There is no added, no added difficulty because the boundary states um, are already given. And so, um, and so this, this is the result for, for Dirichlet boundary conditions where you see again that the low lying levels are working pretty well. And then as you go higher up in this picture, then you start seeing deviations. And it, it's very interesting to understand why the deviation for the Ising model, which has relatively good behavior in terms of density matrix eigenvalue distributions, still is substantially bad. And we think here a large part of this discrepancy for the Dirichlet boundary condition is related to some technical aspect of, of the numerical computation. It has to do with um, the absence of any conserved charge compared to the left hand picture. What is very remarkable, at least I found it remarkable, is that what, what, what you just asked is, is the statement that I computed the ground state energy of the uh, ground state of the Hamiltonian, and from there I can get actually the entire spectrum of the theory. And this is something that, that's rather remarkable because I did not compute with exact diagonalization in something like the, the, the entire spectrum. So, this works only for, for these kind of conformal field theories where there is some, some trick that was discovered by Cardi and Tony where, where they, they could use this, this conformal map to actually show that the entanglement spectrum can be related to the entire spectrum of the theory. Now, this was in the simple case of the, of the Ising model. So the next, the, the next one is the, the free compact boson, which is the, which is which can be also computed with with not too much more work. So 
So the, this is the, 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 the free boson and you see here K is a parameter that, that in the condensed matter community is known as the Luttinger parameter. And it essentially governs the long wavelength correlations of these vertex operators. And here to compute the entanglement spectrum and the entanglement entropies, we again need the boundary states. And these were computed a very long time ago as well. And this is the Dirichlet boundary state. Here R is the, is the compactification radius. And, and phi naught is the, is the expectation value of the field at that where it is pinned to. And, and there is the other boundary state, which is the Neumann boundary state, which, uh, which pins the dual field phi naught tilde. And, and so now we can use these boundary states to, to compute the entanglement properties of the free boson. For instance, we can show that the boundary entropy change as you go from Neumann to Dirichlet boundary condition is one half log two over K. And so if you set now K equals one, which would be the free fermion point, then you recover the result of, of the Ising model. This is because we can understand this as the two decoupled Ising model with the boundary field on one of them. That's why you get the same answer as Affleck and Ludwig. Uh, so, sorry, I have a question. Uh, yes, where are you? Uh, uh, here. Ah, here. Okay. Uh, hi. Uh, so, so is this is this change of boundary, uh, boundary entropy like uh, changing k to one over k or something? Because the duality maps Neumann to Dirichlet, uh, the boundary condition to Neumann to Dirichlet. So um, maybe if you could repeat the question a bit slowly. Ah, sorry, um, I, I'm asking. Um, so the. Uh, the Sorry, uh, boundary entropy for the Dirichlet boundary condition for radius k is the same as the boundary boundary entropy for the Neumann boundary condition at radius one over k or something. Yeah, there is a relation indeed. So, um, ah, okay, okay. so if you if you go back to the boundary states, you will see that the one can be obtained from the other by mm -hmm. r going to two over r. There is this duality that exists, and r is actually <laughs> one over square root of pi k. So that's how you can understand it as well. Right, right. Thank you. Yeah. Very good. So, um, so now um, with these boundary states, we can also compute the entanglement spectrum. This is um, again, um, uh, this doesn't require too much more work. And so one can compute for Neumann case, for instance, that the entanglement spectrum has two, uh, two labels, which are the two integers K and L. So there is a zero point term, which can be computed exactly. It, it has a slightly more involved expression. So I leave that out from the slide. Um, and then you can connect the Ks and the Ls precisely to the dimensions of the primaries and the descendant levels. And each an entanglement energy level is also related to, sorry, has a degeneracy, which is given by the number of integer partitioning of L. And so we, we want to see this in, in terms of a lattice model. And so the simple lattice model that we, um, that we wanted to analyze was this one. So it is a modification of the quantum rotor chain where you see now we have nearest neighbor interactions Ni, Ni plus one, in addition to the usual rotor Hamiltonian. And this model, um, you can analyze, it, it has a complicated phase diagram, but for these, um, these parameters, you do get the free boson theory. And so then we can apply different boundary conditions for this quantum rotor chain and pull it between Dirichlet and Neumann. So this is, excuse me, this is what is shown here. So I'm showing you again, DMRG computations of a total system size of 400. And I'm going from Neumann to Dirichlet. And you see here that again, the, the diminishing of the entropy is very close to what we predicted. And so something that I want to um, emphasize this is something that I forgot to say in the Ising case, which is that the idea is that I apply a boundary field here at the at close to the to the boundary of the system, and this sets a correlation length due to the boundary potential. And so we go long enough distances, so somewhere in the middle of the chain, where we are in the scaling limit, and that's where we look at the difference in entropies. That's how we are calculating the the boundary entropy change. Okay, good. So we can compute the entanglement spectrum also. And, and so this is what we show here. And so on here on the left-hand side, I've shown you the analytical expression. And, 
And so here um, on the on the picture on the y axis, I have rescaled the entanglement energies so as to get the integer L. So L can be non negative and so you can see these are the entries in the for these on the y axis and on the x axis I'm plotting against the integer K and you will see here that on the right hand side here I'm showing you the expected degeneracies that you would get from from the analytical computation and so you see the diamonds here are the are the DMRG data as you see for each of these k you do see these so-called Virasoro towers and within each tower you see the degeneracies if you look closely you will see for the low-lying levels again the agreement is reasonably good and then as you go up then you see that here we get encountering in the, the finite truncation of our numerical results. One thing that is worth mentioning is that we are looking at the reduced density matrix of a many body system. And so it, it's not expected that there would be um, the degeneracies within each symmetry sector. But however, this exists and this for this model simply because it's an integrable model, it has a large number of conserved charges. And that's why you see these degeneracies. So if you were to do level statistics within each symmetry sector, you would see Poissonian statistics as opposed to the generic case of Wigner Dyson statistics. Sorry, can I ask a question? Uh, yes. I just to understand this numerical subtlety a little better. So how many sites are you using to produce this kind of plot? Um, so so the, the size of the system is about 400. I see. And, so, but, but that's so. So there are there are two truncations in this kind of simulation. So there is a finite size effect. There is a finite entanglement truncation. So the, the how well you approximate the gapless system with your numerical algorithm. Mm -hmm. And so there we use uh, what is known as the bond dimension. It's of the order of few hundred. So the truncation errors are below ten to the minus eight or nine, something like that. I see. I see. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Okay, very good. So um, please, please keep asking. That's nice. Um, okay, so um, we can also um, play this um, play this game with the Dirichlet boundary conditions. And so for the lattice model, it's very simple to to apply a boundary potential that then reduces um, that then reduces to the Dirichlet boundary condition case, and then we can compare with our analytical results. And here you again see these are the rescaled entanglement energies for for the Dirichlet boundary condition. And see the low-lying levels again work quite well, and then um, you start seeing deviations higher up here. And in principle, this kind of calculation would work for any of the minimal models. I only showed you the Ising case, and and um, and here I want to show you something else, which is um, related to um, not CFTs but but massive deformations. And and the reason why I want to show this is because. The machinery that is required and the results that you obtain are very similar to the conformal field theory case. So, so now imagine we have a situation where we no longer have just a CFT, but we have a single perturbation by a primary field. So this is shown here. So lambda prime is the is the coupling strength, and phi is this field. So now this perturbation sets a scale. So this is this correlation length. And the entanglement entropy, as I already said earlier in one of the introductory slides, that it would grow as logarithm of the correlation length. So in the vicinity of the critical point, you would still get the central charge. And a simple example would be just the off-criticalizing model where you just tune lambda from away from one and you will get essentially um, it's equals one half with a logarithm of a finite correlation length. The, the remarkable thing is that the entanglement Hamiltonian can still be computed in a very similar way, where now you have a boundary CFT Hamiltonian where the, there are two boundary conditions. One is the boundary condition beta coming from the entanglement cut. And the other boundary condition is the boundary potential that is determined by the same field that you applied in the bulk in the parent system. And the, the statement is that we can compute the spectrum of this boundary CFT with a finite boundary potential, and then we can get the entanglement spectrum. And the entanglement gap, which is the gap between the two lowest 
levels in the entanglement spectrum that goes with one over log of the correlation length. You can understand this as, as, the, as the correlation length goes to infinity, then the, the entanglement gap goes to zero, and you see the gapless in the spectrum of a, of a continuum model. And here it's worth noting that all this is done for, for, um, for a general model. It doesn't require any fine-tuned lattice model. However, you will see that as you look at um, some fine-tuned lattice model, the, the behaviors are surprisingly, um, surprisingly more, more uh, beautiful, let's say. So let's give a simple example. So this is the example of the quantum sine Gordon model. So we have the free boson theory, which is the Hamiltonian, the lattice model was shown here. And then on top, we have a perturbation. So as you know, the sine Gordon model has a cosine perturbation with respect to the free boson theory. And so in terms of the lattice, we just apply this perturbation. And now if you want to look at the entanglement spectrum, we see we get this kind of behavior. This is um, again obtained numerically. And you see that if you look closely, there is a pattern. And so from the partition function of the free boson with Neumann and Dirichlet boundary conditions on both sides, we can predict the, the degeneracies to be like this, one, 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 two, two, three, four, et cetera. And now if you look closely, you will see that the low lying levels indeed have this behavior, but then very quickly the pattern washes away due to our finite simulation errors. And also, also because the lattice model underlying, underlying this um, model is actually not integrable. And this is one of the reasons why I chose the sine Gordon model, because it has, it has another integrable regularization, which is the XYZ spin chain. And this is what I want to show you now, where I where I want to um, explain to you the, the difference between this regularization and the integrable regularization. So we start with the spin chain of Baxter. So we have nearest neighbor SU2 spins and the couplings are satisfying this kind of condition. And the, the bosonization mapping is given here, sigma plus going to e to the i beta phi over two. And the reason why this is very um, useful is that because it is related to the eight vertex model. And so there is some subtlety about being in the principal regime. It's not super important right now, but um, the statement is that the gamma and the delta are related of the eight vertex model. These two parameters are related to the X, Y, Z coupling constants in this way. We can also reparameterize. These are formulas taken directly from Baxter's book. So, um, and so the K and the lambda are defined in terms of these parameters, gamma and delta of the eight vertex model in this way. And the, 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 the reason why these K and the lambda are important is because the entanglement spectrum of the XYZ model is determined entirely by the corner transfer matrix spectrum of the eight vertex model and the entanglement level spacing is given in this form. So this is given as pi lambda over I of K, pi is the elliptic integral of the first kind and K and lambda are determined here. So the recipe is very simple. You are given Jx, Jy, Jz. You calculate gamma and delta. You compute from there K and lambda. Then you get the entanglement spectrum. All of this can be done without any fancy numerical technique on Mathematica. And so I want to show you some, some results that we obtained numerically and compared with these transfer matrix results. So this is the entanglement spectrum obtained numerically with DMRG. And, and you see here that there are equidistant levels and note that here the levels, they are perfectly degenerate. There is no discrepancy like in the previous case. And if you look at the entanglement gap and vary the parameter JY and compare with, with the corner transfer matrix results, you see that they match perfectly indicating that the, that the DMRG computation is working fine. However, if you now compare to the, to the non-integrable regularization, you see that the degeneracy pattern is the same and, and the features are qualitatively, or the degeneracies are quantitatively also the same, but the pattern washes away much quicker for a non-integrable regularization 
as opposed to for the for the integrable one. And potentially um, one can go as high as you want on the left-hand side of the picture and you will always find the perfect degeneracies. And this has to do with the fact that you have um, a very fine-tuned lattice model which where the, where the statistical weights obey the, the Yang-Baxter equation. This is not the case for this model. However, the low-lying levels potentially are the same. And so to, uh, I, I want to end with, uh, with, uh, um, with one of the motivations that why we are looking at these kind of one plus one dimensional systems. And it's because we are very close to um, realizing many of these systems in actual experiments. And, and, the, and the main motivation um, is, to, uh, is to look at one plus one dimensional free boson theory and its perturbations, which can be realized easily with um, with superconducting quantum electronic circuits. Since many of you may not be familiar with, with these circuits, I will just briefly introduce two simple circuit elements that will be sufficient for, our, for, this, for this talk. And so this is a capacitor, it's a superconducting capacitor. It has charge plus and minus Q on its plates. The Hamiltonian is Q squared over 2C. And this is known as a Josephson junction. It is a, it's again one of, one of these um, mesoscopic circuit elements, which can be viewed as a capacitor and a nonlinear inductor in parallel. So the Hamiltonian has two terms, the electrical energy in the capacitor, which is this term, and the magnetic energy in the inductor, which is this term here. It's known that it's a nonlinear inductor, that's why it's a cosine potential. What is very, very important is that these phi and the Q are, are canonically conjugate. They have this commutation relation. And so if you now put together these Josephson junctions next to each other, then you have this Hamiltonian. So you have some nearest neighbor repulsion of these, of these number operators Ni, Ni plus one, and you have a nearest neighbor hopping. This comes from the Josephson effect and this is this term here, cosine phi i minus phi i plus one. And simply by adding capacitors on the vertical link, you get the, the model that describes the free compact boson. And the experiments are not far, far away at all. So one of the first experiments in this direction was done in the Devore group at Yale, where they had an array of 43 such Josephson junctions. So you can really think of a, of a free compact boson field theory of 43 lattice sites. Then there was work done in the Gershenson group at Rutgers with six and 24 junctions. Then in Saclay in France, they had arrays of about 100 Josephson junctions. And more recently now we have um, arrays which are 1500 sites long. And in the Mancharian group in Maryland, they have 33,000 Josephson junctions in this array. So there are 33,000 of them in the upper row and 33,000 in the lower row. And this really realizes the, the free compact boson theory. It has been experimentally observed and potentially it can be modified to add more interactions. This array can be modified to add more interactions giving rise to strongly interacting systems. And the circuit that I showed you of the free boson was realized in the Maryland group experiment. And in the Grenoble group, they connected two such, um, two such free boson circuits with a Josephson junction. And, and this becomes now a quantum electrodynamics problem where now the modes of the electromagnetic element are the Josephson junction plasmons, which are, which are coupled strongly to this impurity atom. And this allowed them to see um, the things that could not occur in nature, like the gigantic lamp shifts, which could not occur in nature because of the smallness of the fine structure constant. And potentially we, we, we have now found ways to, to, to give rise to many more interesting models um, like the Simon Gordon model and its non-trivial generalizations um, using quantum circuits. And that's what I wanted to tell you today. Thank you very much for listening. And um, I want to thank my collaborators, um, Johannes Hauschild at Berkeley, um, Frank Pohlmann in Munich and Hubert Seller in Saclay. Thanks.
Uh, I uh, have a question, but we cannot hear you very well, actually, again. Um, are you asking me? No, no, this was uh, for Kristen. Okay. Yeah, I have a question for you, two questions, actually. Okay. Um, so uh, maybe going from the end to the beginning, this uh, system with the Joseph von Junctions, it's a, is it like a classical system? It's a classical analog of the quantum system? How? No, it's no, a quantum it, system. It's a truly quantum system. And th this is why the... So you see, um, I have written early experiments in Delft in the 90s. So that's when they did the classical systems. They did essentially like two-dimensional XY, classical XY models. But these are truly quantum junctions. The quantum fluctuations of the phase, the phi, is given by the charge, which is the N, uh, the number operator, um, th this thing here. And the reason is that uh, the junctions are small. And so these small junctions then have large phase fluctuations. So these are truly quantum systems. And uh, so the, the other thing that I wanted to ask was, um, can you, so can you reconstruct it, some interfaces with the system? So, you know, basically having with one parameter on one side and one parameter on the other, match them. I'm glad somewhere. you asked. So, um, so you know, this is um, this is totally um, unexpectedly the question that I was hoping to hear. So, um, this these are conformal interfaces of these quantum circuits. So, the idea here is um, imagine that what I had shown you earlier was that you had taken the, this free boson system and calculated the ground state, and you had chopped it at different places and um, different by partitionings and computed the entanglement entropy. And this is this kind of dome-like curve. This is open boundary conditions that I, that I had shown you earlier. And um, as, you, as you are anticipating, I guess, which is that now this is a trivial interface. You can think like this, that there are two CFTs, A and B on, on the two sides, but they have the same central charge and same compactification radius. Um, and if you now look at the scaling with respect to some effective length scale, and then you would again get the central charge of one. Now the, the statement is, how can we get more interesting interfaces? And so the, the statement is very simple. So the compactification radius is tuned by this Josephson junction. So there is no difficulty in getting one set of Josephson junction parameters on this side and one on this side. Doing this in real time, if you wanted to change these junction energies in real time, would be more complicated, but possible. However, building them like as two different set of junction parameters is absolutely feasible. And, and so in terms of this electrical circuit language, it's very simple. You have two different impedance environments. And so there is reflection, which reduces the central charge. And so this is the MRG data for this kind of interface where you now see a jump as you go from one, one Josephson junction array to another. And, and so, um, so the, the, the bulk term for this logarithmic dependence, uh, we know the exact formula from this work of, of Sakai and Sato. And, and so here, when I calculate the scaling, I get 0.975, which is not as accurate as it could be with the MRG, but it's not too far either. The expected value is 0.98. But so the expectation is you get that this, for the entanglement, for example, this log of sign typical behavior just split in two and with a jump? Yeah, that's, pretty, that's exactly it. And then if you, you can calculate the scaling for the interface entropy here for different system size. I'm curious if you could, uh, I don't know, organize an equivalent of the scattering experiment. Or I don't know if you were uh, there in the... Well, you know, um, so um, it would be interesting to, to um, so, so they, in the experiments, they have just built these arrays, which are homogeneous arrays, but um, potentially it would be very interesting to understand how the, um, how some, some scattering properties can shed light on potentially entanglement properties. Just measuring many body entanglement is difficult. Uh, so it's not so simple with these circuits. Um, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yifan, uh, your hand is yeah. raised, but I don't know if that's a relic from a bygone era. Oh, I actually have a question. So um, yeah, thanks for the nice talk. Um, uh, so one question is, uh, how much of this analysis that you did uh, for the entanglement spectrum of the vacuum in the CFT generalized to say in two plus one dimensions? 
Like, how difficult would it, would it be? Um, well, so... Okay, so... For example, for the icing model in two possible dimensions. Yeah, 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 I understand the question. So, um, so you know, numerically, so, so why am I able to calculate this stuff numerically anyway? So, you know, it has to do with this. So, um, so, you know, if you have a gap spectrum, you have finite entanglement entropy. So in one dimensional, there is an efficient representation of any gap system uh, ground state with uh, matrix product states. For a gapless spectrum, you see the entanglement growth is logarithmic. So that means the number of states, crudely speaking, just think of it as, you know, and some like log of some number of states. Mm -hmm. So the number of states would be algebraic. So this is still manageable. However, now, if you think of a two plus one D system, then, then the, um, then the entanglement grows linearly with the right. system, uh, like linear dimension. So mm -hmm. that means that the, the entanglement is linear. So the number of states is exponentially large. So for gapless systems, um, Monte Carlo is the best way. And these kind of tensor network techniques are good for gap systems where you can still have, you know, the MRG on the cylinder, where the size of the cylinder is large compared to the, to the correlation length. But for, for gapless systems, um, Monte Carlo would be a possibility. I, I believe that lots of like the, the, the exponents are for like standard thermodynamic exponents are obtained using Monte Carlo anyway for these and uh, the ent entanglement properties can also be computed like this. Um, but, there is but, another, yeah, sorry. I guess you would also say that uh, this re nice relation between the open string Hamiltonian and the, you know, the entanglement Hamiltonian, that's going to be lost uh, in two plus one. Yeah. Because we know yeah. that transformation. Yeah, because there is no Virasoro business anymore. So, I see. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a really one plus one D thing. Yes. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. Another question I have is, uh, so uh, you explained very well that uh, the entanglement entropy will receive contribution from both both Bach degrees freedom and also boundary degrees freedom, and from the plots that you showed. It seems that the this contribution together are positive to the entanglement entropy. Is that a, a general property? Is there some kind of positivity property of entanglement entropy that tells you no that the contribution no. from okay? No, the, there are the so you know the it's log of the g function and the g function can be um... yeah I know the log of g can certainly be negative. So what I'm asking is. The combination coming from the bulk degrees freedom, which depends on the center charge and the boundary contribution, that together, whether that has some positivity property. Um, okay, so sorry, but but maybe I then uh, misunderstood the question a bit. So okay, let's look at this formula. So For example, yes. So I'm saying that S alpha can be negative. But, yes. But but this whole thing, the whole thing on the right hand side is of course always positive. Right. So so I was saying that uh, that in, implies some kind of bound. On the G functions coming from the center charge. Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe. I'm. I'm not okay. I, I'll. I'll not say too much about that. Um, okay, maybe. that's not something that's known in literature. If, I, if, I don't know. Um, yeah, that, that. That's why I asked this question. Whether there's a bound, potential bound on the on the G function coming from the center charge, from the positivity of the entanglement entropy in the presence of Could be. Could be. I, I don't know. The, I don't know exactly if this is true. But good question. Thank you. All right. Well, let's thank Ananda again. Thank you. And uh, let me remind all of us that uh, after these nice talks today, we have a discussion section in ten minutes' time at the same link. So. Uh, you want to take a break for a few minutes, and then if you can, please do come back for the discussion.